Hey, Herb, how are you today? Hey, Bob, good to see you. How was your weekend? It was great. It was good great. to see you again. I haven't good seen you quite a while. Well, it's good to see you how again. How was your trip down? It was good. It was really good. I, I got a question for you. Sure. We're supposed to be talking about quality education, right, quality right, teachers, right. effective teachers. Why are we meeting in the gym? Well, you know me. I always do things obtusely. Actually, I wanted to create a backdrop to share something with you. You know, my son Steve was an excellent high school football player. And one day he said to me, Dad, what do you think would happen to you if your worst enemy could make up in grade all of your exams? And I was startled. Of course, I couldn't do very good that way, but I asked him, why do you ask me? He says, well, he says, when we have a game to play, we get a, a film from the other team. Uh -huh. And their coach knows what film he's sending us. So as we're practicing his plays, he's telling his team they're not going to use those plays because that's what we're practicing for. We get out on the field, they don't have one play that looks the same as anything that we've seen during the week. I have to innovate think for myself, see what I really know. But if this was the classroom, my coach would call a timeout, go up to the referee and say, hey, ref, make them play fair. When we practiced all week, number 24 was running in motion. Now he's not even in the game. Put him back in the game. You see, he said, my coach prepares us, their coach tests us and see what we really know. Sort of changing the rules midstream. Yeah, yeah. In other words, having to perform by somebody else's standards. Are you suggesting that teachers use that formula? No, no, no. I, though I think it would be interesting because I think it would be a way of validating what real genuine teaching effectiveness was. I was just thinking if we extended this beyond the realm of that example to have the teacher-student relationship replaced by what happens with coach and player. For example, I think, for example, that just by that one thing alone, a grade point average will go up by about a half a letter grade. Sounds pretty interesting. I don't know if I can believe it at all. Why don't we go into one of the classrooms down in the school here and see about I think it'd be fun. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. Okay, let's go ahead. Herb, that was a very interesting idea you spoke to me about in the gymnasium just a few moments ago, and I want to hear more about it. But I'd like to hear a little more about you as a person and a professional first. I know that in 1986, you were selected as this nation's outstanding faculty member by the Association of Community College Trustees pretty important honor, I would think. And since that time, you've spoken to literally thousands and thousands of educators around the country about your ideas of education. But there's another question that bothers me a little bit. For 22 years, you've been a senior lecturer at MIT, mm -hmm. Center for Advanced Engineering Studies, right. one of the most prestigious colleges in our country. Simultaneously, for 16 years, you've been in Bunker Hill Community College teaching math as a professor of math, a school that's large, urban, public, open-door policy, anybody can go. That's an extraordinary mixture. Tell me why that works and if it should work. Well, it, it sounds like an extraordinary mixture until we come back to our coaching versus playing analogy. For example, have you ever noticed that if a person were lucky enough to be a great athlete and also a great coach, that it's quite possible that the team he would choose to coach is not the same team he would choose to play for? In general, great athletes want to play on great teams. And great coaches want to coach the teams that nobody else had success with so that they can prove that they're great coaches. So I guess, Bob, in that context, you could say, I play math at MIT, and I coach it at the community college. How does that relate to teaching? I, I think that's what I said in the gymnasium. I can understand what you're saying, but how does it relate to this profession called education? Well, basically, we recognize in sports that great players do not automatically become great coaches. It sometimes happens, but it's not the norm. Yet, in academia, that's exactly how we go about hiring our coaches. In other words, technically speaking, if I have a doctorate in math, all that means is that I can play mathematics. If I've published in math, that means I can play mathematics. It says nothing about my ability to be able to communicate uh, with the students that I'm trying to teach. So basically, if you want to be sarcastic about it, it turns out that the university is perhaps the only place in the country where you hire people by one set of credentials and judge them by a completely different set of credentials. You follow what point I'm trying to sure make here? Sure do. See, now, basically, I think what happened was, in the old days, the players who were hired to coach were coaching players who were destined to become great players. In other words, I've never coached a basketball team of my life. But if somebody put a gun to my head and said, Herb, produce a basketball championship team, I would only hope that they would give me the Boston Celtics with Magic Jordan, uh, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins thrown Can't in. get those names mixed I up. I know, I know. It's not down here especially. <laughs> but anyway, you see, what I'm saying is with a team like that, I would start any five players, and I would only give them two instructions. The first one would be, when you're tired, take yourself out of the game. 
And the second one is, as you go to the bench and you go past me, tell me who I should put in to replace you with. And my claim is that with just those two instructions alone, I will take that team to the NBA playoffs. I might not win the championship with them, but I'll get them to the playoffs. You see, when you have that kind of talent, it doesn't really much matter how you're teaching. But you see, what's happening now is students are becoming more and more non-traditional. The gap between how the professor perceives things and how the student coming into school perceives things are now quite different. You see, and I think now the need for being a great coach becomes even more important. Now, let me mention that, you know, what I'm saying doesn't necessarily apply just to community colleges, but since that's where I have my experience, let me begin uh, by just mentioning that. Well, let's talk about that analogy a bit. How about that open door policy and open access concept of community colleges where would you take that club to the uh, final four if you had no. all these walk-ons, millions no. upon millions of walk-ons? That's right. See, try to look at it this way. Suppose there was a class action suit. Oh, I don't care what state. Let's say Ohio State. Mm -hmm. And the Ohio State football coach is told that he can no longer discriminate because of race, color, creed, or ability. Anybody who's a citizen of Ohio has a right to try out for the football team. And consequently, the first 50 people who try out, that's going to be your football team no matter what else. Do you think the same coaching techniques that we use now in the Big Ten would work? I don't, think, I don't so. think so. I don't think so. See, but that's exactly what happens when you teach at the community college. And you see, the greatness of America is that we have to keep that door open. You know, it's very easy to joke about, uh, not to joke, but to talk, to oversimplify what's happening, say, in Central America, where we talk it's the Sandinistas and the Contras. We talk it's Marxism versus capitalists. The truth of the matter is that what's happening in Central America is something you can expect to happen any place in the world where two-thirds or more of the population have no hope for upward mobility. You see, the greatness of America is the, th is the guarantee of access, not necessarily the guarantee of success. In fact, you may have remember reading in last week's newspaper, and uh, I'm sure by the time people listen to what we're having to say, there'll be other examples. You notice that the Siberian coal miners went on strike in Russia for the first time. And the quote in the paper said that the coal miners said, why shouldn't we strike? The everything is hopeless. And even in Russia, when things get hopeless, people will go out on strike. So that basically, you see, we have to take care of the masses. And keep in mind one very, very important thing, and that is that no matter where you are, half of the population is always going to be below the other half. You see, the, the lower half of a class at Harvard may be above the upper half, say, at Bunker Hill Community College. But the lower half of the class at Harvard isn't competing with Bunker Hill Community College. Relative to their frame of reference, they are the group that can feel without hope, even though they're at Harvard. I don't, I don't know if that's making sense to you, but this is the direction in which I want to come from. Mm -hmm. The direction that says, as teachers, the more we deal with people who tend to be disenfranchised, the more important it becomes that we really work with our students, that we really coach them. You know, you're, you're working right now at this moment with some prisoners in prison educators at Harnett County in North Carolina. That's right. A uh, program called Gateways to Mathematics. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how it fits into some of your previous statements? Okay, first of all, before I tell you what Gateways to Mathematics deals with in terms of be being a coach, okay. let, let me tell you something about being a prisoner. You see, we have two kinds of prisoners in America today. We have the prisoner who was incarcerated, who I prefer to call an inmate. Then we have the prisoner who's not incarcerated, who I call an outmate. Now, who is that kind of a prisoner? It could be the single parent who doesn't have access to daycare centers, you see. It could be the worker at McDonald's making $4 an hour with no hope for upward mobility. It could be anybody, you see. The basic difference between an inmate and an outmate is that at least an inmate, if his God is doing the job properly, will not freeze to death on the streets of Boston during the winter. Mm -hmm. And so basically, whatever happens to the prison inmate will also be applicable to the prison outmate. And basically what I've tried to do with gateways is to incorporate an approach to teaching people mathematics, which may seem like a strange way to start, but most people have very, very low self-esteem when it comes to mathematics. And so low self-esteem is transferable. If you feel that you have lousy self-esteem in one area, you'll transfer that to another area, and you start to become to feel inadequate. Is that global at all levels of education, would you say? And, uh, when you say low self-esteem and mathematics is an area where, you know, is personified? I think so. I, I think basically, uh, 
low self-esteem, especially with the disadvantaged group, the lower half of the class. They've, they've never been that successful in education. They don't look at themselves as being successes, and that causes them to have a very low self-image. Now, if that self-image spreads beyond that, I always like to think of the, of the commandment that says, love thy neighbor as thyself. And think about what that implies if you don't think much of yourself. It basically says, if I treat my neighbor as myself, and I don't feel like treating myself very good, I don't have to treat my neighbor so well either. You see, so you do have that kind of a problem. And I think that one of the reasons that these things come up is going back to a sports analogy again. Uh, you know, in sports, teams will play the whole season just for the advantage of being the home team. In other words, in the playoffs, it's very, very advantageous to be the home team. In the average American classroom, the professor is always the home team, and the student is always the visiting team. For example, the professor says things like, I want the homework in by Tuesday, and for every day that it's late, I'm going to lower the grade by one letter grade. The captain of the student team never has the right to stand up and say, look, we worked hard to get this paper in on time, so we want them back the next class period. For every day you're late handing them back to us, we want you to raise the grade by one. So that's called being insolent of sorts. So basically, we have to find a way, Bob, I think, to make education more relevant to the people that we're trying to teach. And Gateways is based, in my mind, on three premises. It's based on the fact that the teacher as a coach has three things that you do that the teacher as a player doesn't necessarily have to do. You see, first of all, I think it's very, very important to master your material. Because if you haven't mastered the material and you don't know what's important, who cares how effectively you coach it? But the three ingredients of being the master teacher as a coach, as I see it, is first of all to make the material relevant to the needs of the students. Too often, as instructors, we say, this is why it's important to me. We don't relate to the person that we're trying to help. I'm not saying that it's easy to do this, but it forces you to put yourself into the position of the student and say, what is it that this person really needs? What is it that will make this material relevant to the needs of the student? See, relevancy uh, to the student. Okay? The second thing that's very, very important is a delivery system. You see, one of the things that happens in American education that really upsets me is the number of people who fail a course for no greater reason than the fact at which they're comfortably able to learn turns out to be slower than the arbitrarily prescribed pace in a typical classroom. And so that what you wind up with is this idea that a student is called learning disabled, he's called slow, just because he can't keep up. Now, in the old days, it wasn't possible, as we mentioned in our little introduction before, for a teacher to be in a thousand different places at the same time. Today, when a student is on chapter four, when the professor is on chapter seven, there's absolutely no reason why the professor can't have videotaped lectures of chapter five, chapter six. Like, was it Delta Airlines that says, we're ready when you are? The videotape can be ready whenever the student is ready. See, the technology that we have today allows us to do things that we couldn't do when I first became a teacher. And the most important ingredient that a good teacher has is the ability to create a learning environment that is a live support system for the student, an extended family type of thing, to keep that student in the ball game, so to speak, long enough so that when something good is destined to happen, the student will be there to see it happen. You see, in essence, if you have a great delivery system, great content, great everything, but you don't give the student high self-esteem, that student will still do poorly. If you give the student mediocre materials, a mediocre delivery system, and high self-esteem, the student will do well. All of us have learned the subject at one time or another, in spite of the teacher or in spite of the book. Rev, can you give us some specifics of personal examples, either in your professional life, how you've taken relevancy and delivery and self-esteem, and used it as part of your class, or perhaps a colleague of yours, to so get a little more idea of what you mean by it? Well, basically, I try to make every subject I teach into a game. I don't know if that's what you have in mind. I mean, basically, one of the first ways to make things relevant, uh, and we'll talk about, we're going to have some other lectures in which we'll talk about other discussions, okay. where we'll talk about relevancy separately and we'll talk about delivery separately. But one of the ways of getting people interested is to think of what we do in terms of sports. When a kid wants to learn baseball and we say to him, three strikes is an out, that kid doesn't say, that doesn't seem relevant to me. I'm a lousy hitter. I think there should be seven strikes as an out. People accept the fact that if there's a rule of a game, 
you either accept the rule or you don't play the game. So one of the first things I try to do is to teach my subject as if it was a game. And in fact, I think this is a great common denominator for anybody who wants to be a teacher. You see, basically, what are the three ingredients that go into a game? And in fact, I think you might find this kind of interesting to see how you can make a game out of any subject. You know, it reminds me of an old anecdote that the kind of riddle that was going around when I was in junior high school would be something like, what smells like cheese looks like a box and flies? And the answer would be a flying cheese box. Basically, what I want to do is, what is it that all games have in common? Such that if we wanted to define a game, every game would have that particular thing in common. We well, see, what happens is, in terms of a game, is every game has an objective. And the objective is usually to win. Of course, that doesn't tell you much. You see, for example, suppose somebody says to me, the objective of checkers is to capture all of your opponent's pieces. I say, good. I sit down to play with them. I say, look over there. And as soon as he looks, I take all the pieces off the board. You see, if there was a rule in checkers that said, if your opponent is dumb enough to take his eyes off the board, you can steal the pieces, you see, then you'd be able to do that. But there is no such rule. You see, the objective is to win, but in terms of the rules of the game. The problem is that the rules of the game are simply relationship between terms. See, like when you say three strikes is an out, what does that mean if the person doesn't know what a strike is or what an out is? So basically, now you have to have definitions. Now, you say, I understand that works in any game, but how does that work, say, in English? Well, you see, suppose I split an infinitive or I end a sentence with a preposition. Why should the ta teacher make me feel like a barbarian? Especially since Winston Churchill is the one who, when he was corrected for ending a sentence with a preposition, said, ending, correcting my grammar is something up with which I shall not put. I mean, aside from the fact that you can end a sentence in a preposition, why should I feel like a barbarian if I don't? All the teacher has to say to me is, look, her, ending a sentence in a preposition is no more logical in the game of good grammar then three strikes is an out in the game of baseball. But if you want to communicate effectively with your fellow human being in the game of good grammar, just like we accept three strikes as an out in baseball, we accept these rules in grammar. And basically what happens then? You take the rules of the game and the definitions and you apply something called strategy to carry out the objectives. In other words, if you want to be technical about it, a game is any system consisting of definitions rules and an objective, where the objective is carried out as an inescapable consequence of the definitions and the rules by strategy. And the beauty is the strategy emphasizes the logical part and the definitions and the rules are the memory. Now obviously, if the rules are going to be based, if you want the objective to predict the real world, then obviously the rules have to be based on reality as we know it. Mm -hmm. But even just making a model like this, forces us as teachers to say, now, what is it that we want the kids to know? What is the objective of our game? What are the rules? Why are the rules there? Are they frivolous or are they logical? And if they are capricious, let's just tell the student that that's the way it is. If we're going to tell a student from our frame of reference that he has to do something and the student doesn't see it from their own frame of reference, already they start to feel there's no relevance in the educational system. You see, and that's basically the direction in which I feel that we should be coming from. In other words, that not only are we coaches, but the subject that we teach, the subject that we teach. All subjects? All subjects. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Every subject has definitions, rules, and an objective. Even in math, when I went to school, one of the reasons I hated math when I first learned it was I thought my teacher was crazy. They taught us what an axiom was. And they said to me, an axiom is something self-evident, but you can't prove it. Well, first of all, if you can't prove it, how do you know it's self-evident? And the second thing is, self-evident to whom? It wasn't self-evident to me. Can you imagine me saying to my teacher, this axiom isn't self-evident to me? And the teacher says, well, it better be by Friday, because we're going to have a test on it. You see, if all they had said to me was, look, an axiom is a rule of the game of mathematics. And since we want our game to predict the real world accurately, we try to make up our rules to coincide with reality. In fact, the only difference between pure and applied mathematics is whether the rules of the game are based on reality 
or whether they're simply arbitrarily chosen to be logically consistent, but not modeled after anything in the real world. You have a good model. What motivated you to the model? I mean, is it something well, that developed slowly, or is it yeah, something yeah, you just it, thought about? It was, it was almost like self-defense. Uh, during the new math, people would say to me, we've heard that mathematics requires a lot of memory. And other people says, I can't do math because it requires too much logic. Which one does it really require? And you see, the game model is a perfect way to separate for the students the difference between what you memorize and how you do critical thinking. You see, the definitions and the rules not only are permitted to be memorized, but they're almost mandatory. How else would you explain to a person that three strikes is an out? Are you going to say that two wouldn't have been enough and four would have been too many? How do you explain to a person why there's 52 cards in the deck? You're going to say because there's 52 weeks in the year? Well, does that mean to a guy who plays Pinochle there are only 48 cards in the deck? You see, basically the idea is that when you, when you want people to understand the rules of the game, there's nothing wrong with telling the person there are certain things that you have to memorize. But when you want them to learn, you've got to show them the critical thinking part. Is it possible, for example, that a person could learn the rules real fast and still be a bad player? Another person takes a long time to learn the game, but once he learns, he becomes a great player. Now, the idea is we could talk about this for a long time. Hopefully, this is just going to generate some discussion for other people to think about. Well, and do that a little bit for me, though. Relate rules and regulations to relevancy, say. Well, ba basically, uh, what I'm saying is if you have a rule that's just there for, for cosmetic effect, because people have always accepted that way, appeal to people in terms of a game, but that's the way the game is played. If it's going to go beyond that, show the person based on his frame of reference what's really happening. But what I don't want to be lost in the shuffle here is the fact that there is no one right way to be a coach and one right way to define a game. Well, all of us as teachers are the hallmark of what the future of America is going to be. The people's right to know must never be confused with the people's desire to snoop. And basically, we as educators are the ones who are going to be carrying this nation into the 21st century. What I'd like to do is to conclude this segment of our discussion with a selection I'd like to read to you that was given to me by an inmate who was an American Indian. And he told me that his tribe, and maybe this is true for all Indians, but his tribe never owned land. They felt you couldn't own something that you couldn't take with you. And he said, I read something in a magazine that I want you to have. And he gave it to me, and I kept it, and I always like to use it. And I just don't like to read it on the screen because I have to put on my glasses, and that ruins an otherwise beautiful face. But this is called the Scholar's Creed, and I think it's something beautiful that applies to all teachers, and I'd like to just close with this for today. It says this, I believe that the knowledge I have received or may receive from teacher and book does not belong to me, that it is committed to me only in trust, that it still belongs and always will belong to the humanity that produced it through all the generations. I believe that I have no right to administer this trust in any manner whatsoever that may result in injury to mankind its beneficiary. On the contrary, I believe it is my duty to administer it singly for the, for the good of this beneficiary to the end that the world may become a kindlier, a happier, and a better place in which to live. And I think, in a way, this says it all. And that when we come down to it, I happen to believe in the three criteria I gave for what makes the teacher an outstanding coach. But I don't believe there is any one single way just to remember that we are the Statue of Liberty for those who are academically disenfranchised, in particular to the lower half of any group. Well, let me see. We're going to have to tune up this conversation to finish up in this little segment. But I'd like to, I jotted down some ideas. I got those three points. I want to make sure I got them right. Okay, sure. Make the material relevant to the needs of the students. Correct. Regardless of the academic Regardless area of the subject right. matter. Develop a delivery system that makes the lower half better able to compete with the upper half. Right. And that could be any kind of technology that you can imagine. Right. At any school, at any, any school. level, okay. any subject. And last, and one which we should all live by, as you tried to show us in that little uh, memo there, provide a live support system that encourages students to hang in there, self-esteem, right. right. until good things happen. Well, that's it, Bob. Those three things. Have, you, that's all I had to say at the beginning. We could have saved all this half hour. Well, that's you did wonderful. a great job. I hope everybody else feels the same way as you did. And I hope that you feel as excited as you did when we were out in the gym talking about this. I mean, this has tremendous ramifications. I think you could make up a year course based just on this analogy at all levels. Well, I know you believe it. I've heard you talk about it to friends and colleagues and so forth. It's something that's very dear to you. 
perhaps we can get the rest of our colleagues involved in this energy. That's the way it will work out with all of them as well. Thank right. you so much for this oh, very you, brief Bob. time together. Thanks, Bob.